Samantha Nelson grew up in an abusive home, but she was unprepared for the abuse she would suffer at the hands of her pastor. Samantha and her husband, Steve, are the founders of The Hope of Survivors, an organization that reaches out to victims of pastoral abuse. They're here today to talk about clergy misconduct. Thank you so much for joining me, Samantha. Thank you, Valerie. Now, you know, when I first saw your booklet and read all of your information, I was like, wow. Um, I just want to know more about our story because I have to tell you, after being a journalist for, you know, for so many years and covering sexual misconduct in the church, um, sometimes I was like, oh, I hear women say that they were abused or taken advantage mm -hmm. of. And I don't, I didn't always buy the story because you're consenting adults. But after mm -hmm. I watched your DVD and read your story, in your booklet, I was like, oh, this is worth taking a second look. So take me back to the time when um, this first occurred and tell us what happened. Well, when it first occurred, I was going through a lot of difficult situations in my own life. I mm -hmm. had poor health. I had come from a very abusive home, as you mentioned earlier. And I was struggling to recover from that and really be grounded by what God has to say about abuse and how he can heal me through his word. And the pastor had a, a process where we had grown close to him and his family. I looked up to him as my spiritual father and he was 27 years older than me. So that was kind of a natural thing for me and I didn't have a good father role model growing up. So as we became closer and he put me in different positions in the church always so that he could work closer to me. Looking back, we were able to see what a grooming process it mm -hmm. was. But when it finally came to the point where he was going to counsel me for the abuse of my past, that's when things really got um, heated up as it were. And he started putting a lot of pressure on me to have sex with him and to do different things with him. Well, okay, let, you said that he was counseling you for the abuse of the past. Yes. You talked about in your, um, in your DVD that we're going to see, you're gonna join us again tomorrow. And so we're gonna see more of your DVD and your story. You said that when you were younger, the kids called you the poster child, the Ethiopian poster yes. child. So it started when you were young and that's yes. because you were um, anorexic and Correct. bulimic. And so- Not bulimic, just, just anorexic. anorexic. I just didn't eat. <laughs> okay, you just didn't eat. Yeah. Okay, and as a result of that, of that, the kids picked at you. So it started then and then you were um, abused by three football players. Yes. Is that correct? Our high school football players, yes. They, it was a, a gang rape situation and mm -hmm. I didn't know what I was getting into. I was invited to a party to, mm -hmm. to a friend's house and when I went there I was the only one there besides these three football players and I um, you know said no but there's not really anything I could do. I was very little and didn't have much power at that time plus being abused at home didn't know that right. I could you know, run and scream and what would I do? Because I was afraid if my parents found out I was even there, then I'd be in bigger trouble when I got yeah. home. Now, when this uh, event happened with the pastor, you two were married then, right? That's true, yes, yeah. we were. So what was kind of set up like where your relationship was at and your thoughts when you found out about this? Well, I kind of had suspicions as going into this because there was something about this pastor that didn't seem right. He, his mannerisms were a little too close he mm -hmm. was always wanting to be around Samantha. He would make excuses to come to visit our office. We had a business at that time. And so there was this uncomfortable feeling. We'd go to Bible study at his home and he wanted to make sure that Samantha always sat by him. So there was this dynamic that was in place that just didn't feel right. Yeah. Did you guys ever, uh, you know, did you ever confront him or sit down with him and say, hey, you know, you're crossing the line? I did after I found out what was going on mm -hmm. and of course that was too late at that point in time. I actually backing up, I did come to him at one time prior to that and I told him I was uncomfortable with what I was feeling about him. I did, told him I didn't think I could trust him mm. and he was very reassuring. He, he actually put his hand on my shoulder and he says, you know, I want you to trust me, Steve. Mm. And so inside there's this whole dynamic going on where I don't trust you, but you're telling me I can trust you. And it just, it just wreaked havoc in my emotions because someone in that role is a, places himself in a position where we give them automatic trust. Yeah. Why wouldn't you trust a pastor? Yeah. Well now, Samantha, did you consent to having sex with this pastor? No, initially I didn't. I told him no. The first time that it became fully sexual was in the church office and I was telling him, no, I don't want to do this. And he did anyway. Mm -hmm. And later on, 
when it came out that I told him, you know, you, you write me in the church office, he says, oh, well, that was a misunderstanding. Okay, yeah. but that's my main question. When, when it came to that point, there are people who are watching saying, why didn't you call the police mm -hmm. then? Yeah. Well, because I was afraid. Okay. I was afraid of a lot of things. One, I was afraid of losing my husband if he found out. You've got to understand, when someone in the role of spiritual authority is grooming you into this mm -hmm. type of relationship, this abusive relationship, they, when our counseling started, initially it was talking about what I had gone through. And I had told him at that time that I was deathly afraid of ever being in a situation where I might be raped again and that I felt that if I was put in that situation, I would probably just go along with it because emotionally it would okay. be easier to do that than to feel that helplessness, powerlessness, and violation again. So he knew that while he's grooming me, while he's counseling, and when he, uh, you know. So then what happened with this pastor after this, this one incident in the office? Where did you go from there? He continued to pursue his, his comment at that time, oh, just this once and then I'll leave you alone and we can continue with counseling. You're feeling like you have to do what this man says because there's no other options. Who am I going to tell? Mm -hmm. Who's going to believe me? Um, as the relationship progressed, you have what I call it's similar to Stockholm Syndrome, where a victim will feel sympathy for her abuser in some way, um, even in some ways feel like this is something that you wanted. Uh, I felt love for him, not romantic love, but as a father figure and as my spiritual mentor. And it was hard to separate that from what he was doing. I just kept telling him, why can't you just be who you're supposed to be? You know, leave me alone. You know, go to your wife for these mm -hmm. things, you know, and it wasn't the sexual aspect of the relationship was never anything that I had wanted or pursued. And it was very hard to get out of. He began stalking us. As I withdrew, he would stalk me. When I saw, uh, excuse me, other counselors, mm -hmm. he would follow me to my counseling appointment. Mm. Well, okay, so there are women and men who are watching us today. Talk a little bit about the grooming process so that they too can be warned about the, the telltale signs, the danger signs. Mm -hmm. You said that alarms were going off in you and your emotions, um, and, and, and yet we just sometimes don't heed the warning. Right. Um, what, what is involved in the grooming process when a, when a predator is grooming a person to sexually abuse them? A lot of things, actually, and it can be very, very subtle at first. You mm -hmm. won't notice um, putting me in positions of trust in the church where he and I would work closely together. Uh, affirming me. I was very sick at the time in a lot of pain. One of his emails to me was, oh, I wish you weren't in so much pain. Let me cry for you. And I was like, don't cry for me. I'm used to it. I've been in pain for a lot of years, you know. But that type of thing, playing on your sympathy. For some women, it's um, playing on, on their ego or their sense of pride, you know. I didn't feel that was so much in my case. It was just more of his father figure role that really got me because I had been abused by my stepfather so much. Um, what are some of the other things that you picked up on during that grooming process? I think it's important to realize that some of the statistics show that mm -hmm. uh, up to one in four women have been abused. So there's a large pool of women out there that could be potential victims if you want to look at that from a perspective. Someone who is looking for someone to abuse is going to look for someone who has vulnerabilities. That person in that role of spiritual authority should be able to recognize this person needs help. And instead of helping them, they seek to exploit them. So they're going to take and make the situation work to whatever fits that victim. So it wouldn't be a, an exact pat answer that we could say this, this, mm -hmm. and this will meet. This is what they're going to do. But when someone starts to get too close, there's too much interest being shown in them, too much connection to their life beyond what is pastoral, that should be a flag. What, what is the reason for this? Well, you talk in the booklet about automatic trust, and mm -hmm. that is um, the first, I guess, that's the first step that you take in, in, in allowing this person to come to get into your private space. Right. Is but that, is that a mistake, even with a pastor in yes. today's modern times? It's unfortunate, but should we just automatically give you know, that much trust to just anybody? No, we need to make sure the person we're trusting is actually trustworthy. And... Um, one of the things, Valerie, like, like you mentioned, people do give that automatic trust, and many times people still do today to mm -hmm. that pastor. But that's part of the problem when you're trusting this person, you're believing that God is speaking through them. You see them up in the pulpit, and you see a godly person is what you yeah. think. Mm -hmm. So then that man comes to you, 
Oh, Valerie, you're looking good today. Oh, I like that dress on you. You know, you're gonna, the Holy Spirit's going to give you this little red flag come up, and you're going to think, you know, that's not really appropriate. But you're going to dismiss it because you're going to think, well, that's a pastor. He didn't mean anything by it. Mm -hmm. And those little things will progress and progress and progress. It's kind of wearing you down, wearing your defenses down, and getting you acclimated to something that's really inappropriate before the next what, step. What role do the people around someone who could become a victim play, like uh, a spouse or parents or even just, you know, maybe if a teen doesn't have parents, you know, if there's their friends around and play in avoiding this scenario? I think affirmation of someone who is a victim, mm -hmm. people who are victims are have been abused, obviously. And yeah. so uh, someone who's been abused doesn't have a good sense of self-worth, self-value. So making that person realize their importance to them, but also in God's perspective. Uh, that's the important part for a victim, to understand that it's not what you or I think of them, it's, it's how their relationship to God, how he views their life and where he's taking them is it, important. Because when a pastor steps into a role and starts to abuse someone, they are usurping God's authority and they're stepping between that person and their relationship to God. And now they've disconnected them from God, the source of healing, and they are destroying their life. And of course, the pastor should, should know better. Well, Samantha, you talk about, you give some, um, some warning signs here in, in your booklet. It says, what is wrong behavior? Hugging you too often or too closely. Um, kissing you, constantly looking at you, having you sit close to him on his lap. This, act, this sort of thing actually happens. It does. In fact, after we started the Hope Survivors, we had a situation where a victim called us and her church situation was such that the pastoral team developed their own brand of counseling, as mm -hmm. it were, and called it pastoral cradling. And this... What? Yeah. This pastor would have... The, he would only counsel the women, and mm. she, his wife, would counsel the men. And when he counseled the women, he would have them sit on his lap and cradle them. And, of course, that led to a lot of sexual activity that was extremely abusive and inappropriate. But, again, that's a situation where the leader... If you're talking about predatory pastors, they know what they're doing. They know mm -hmm. how to break people down. They know how to groom the whole congregation so that no one's going to question them. Mm -hmm. And they can make it seem like, oh, it was just an affair or, oh, it didn't happen. This woman's crazy. Um, we've had other cases where very vulnerable women, handicapped women, have been abused by their pastor. Um, and it's played off as, you know, she's disabled. She doesn't know what she's talking about type of thing. It's mm -hmm. really sad. And when you mention that, you know, I haven't heard about abuse so much or you think it's an affair, much of what you hear as an affair is actually clergy sexual abuse. Okay. Well, we're going to talk more with Samantha and Steve Nelson, um, the founders of The Hope of Survivors. We talked about her testimony today, what led to this abuse, and tomorrow she's going to join us, a very provocative story about clergy sexual abuse and how you can avoid becoming a victim. To contact Samantha and Steve Nelson, go to thehopeofsurvivors.com or you can go to harvest-tv.com and click on show info in the menu bar for an easy way to link to their site. Harvest will return in a moment with Braxton Brady and part one of the series on what dads need to do.